Kazimir Stanislavovich by Von Bunin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the yellow card with a nobleman's coronet, the young porter at the Hotel Versailles somehow managed to read the Christian name and patronymic Kazimir Stanislavovich. There followed something still more complicated and still more difficult to pronounce. The porter turned the card this way and that way in his hand, looked at the passport which the visitor had given him, shrugged his shoulders. None of those who stayed at the Versailles gave their cards. Then he threw both onto the table and began again to examine himself in the silvery milky mirror which hung above the table, whipping his thick hair with a comb. He wore an overcoat and shiny top boots. The gold braid on his cap was greasy with age. The hotel was a bad one. Kazimir Stanislavovich left Kiev for Moscow on April 8th, Good Friday, on receiving the telegram with the one word, Tenth. Somehow or another, he managed to get the money for his fare, and took his seat in the second-class compartment, gray and dim, but really giving the sensation of comfort and luxury. The train was heated, and that railway carriage heat, and the smell of the heating apparatus, and the sharp tapping of the little hammers on it, reminded Kazimir Stanislavovich of other times. At times it seemed to him that winter had returned, that in the fields the white, very white drifts of snow had covered up the yellowish bristle of stubble and the large leaden pools where the wild ducks swam. But often the snowstorm stopped suddenly and melted, the fields grew bright, and one felt that behind the clouds was much light, and the wet platforms of the railway stations looked black, and the rooks called from the naked poplars. At each big station, Kazimir Stanislavovich went to the refreshment room for a drink and returned to his carriage with newspapers in his hands, but he did not read them. He only sat and sank in the deep smoke of his cigarettes, which burned and glowed, and to none of his neighbors, Odessa Jews who played cards all the time, did he say a single word. He wore an autumn overcoat, of which the pockets were worn, a very old black top hat, and new but heavy cheap boots. His hands, the typical hands of a habitual drunkard, and an old inhabitant of basements, shook when he lit a match. Everything else about him spoke of poverty and drunkenness. No cuffs, a dirty linen collar, an ancient tie, an inflamed and ravaged face, bright blue watery eyes. His side whiskers, dyed with a bad brown dye, had an unusual appearance. He looked tired and contemptuous. The train reached Moscow next day. Not at all up to time. It was seven hours late. The weather was neither one thing nor the other, but better and drier than in Kiev, with something stirring in the air. Kazimir Stanislavovich took a cab without bargaining with the driver and told him to drive straight to the Versailles. I have known that hotel, my good fellow, he said suddenly breaking his silence, since my student days. From the Versailles, as soon as his little bag, tied with a stout rope, had been taken up to his room, he immediately went out. It was nearly evening. The air was warm. The black trees on the boulevards were turning green. Everywhere there were crowds of people, cars, and carts. Moscow was trafficking and doing business, was returning to the usual pressing work, was ending her holiday, and unconsciously welcoming the spring. A man who has lived his life and ruined it feels lonely on a spring evening on a strange, crowded city. Kazimir Stanislavovich walked the whole length of Tverskoy Boulevard. He saw once more the cast-iron figure of the musing Pushkin, the golden and lilac top of the Stratznoy Monastery. For about an hour he sat at the Café Filipov, drank chocolate, and read old comic papers. Then he went to a cinema whose flaming signs shone from far down the Tverskoya through the darkling twilight. From the cinema he drove to a restaurant on the boulevard which he had also known in his student days. He was driven by an old man, bent in a bow, sad, gloomy, deeply absorbed in himself, in his old age, and in his dark thoughts. All the way, the man painfully and wearily helped on his lazy horse with his whole being, murmuring something to it all the time, and occasionally bitterly reproaching it. And at last, when he reached the place, he allowed the load to slip from his shoulders for a moment and gave a deep sigh as he took the money. I did not catch the name and thought you meant Brog, he muttered, turning his horse slowly. He seemed displeased, although the Prague was further away. I remember the Prague too, old fellow, answered Kazimir Stanislavovich. You must have been driving for a long time in Moscow. Driving? said the old man. I have been driving now for fifty-one years. That means you may have driven me before, said Kazimir Stanislavovich. Perhaps I did, 
answered the old man dryly. There are a lot of people in this world. One can't remember all of you. Of the old restaurant once known to Kazimir Stanislavovich, there remained only the name. Now it was a large, first-class, though vulgar restaurant. Over the entrance burned an electric globe, which illuminated with its unpleasant heliotrope light the smart, second-rate cabmen, impudent and cruel to their lean, short-winded steeds. In the damp hall stood pots of laurels and tropical plants, of the kind which one sees carried onto the platform from weddings to funerals and vice versa. From the porters' lodge, several men rushed out together to Kazimir Stanislavovich, and all of them had just the same thick curl of hair as the porter at the Versailles. In the large greenish room, decorated in the Rococo style, were a multitude of broad mirrors, and in the corner burnt a crimson icon lamp. The room was still empty, and only a few of the electric lights were on. Kazimir Stanislavovich sat for a long time alone, doing nothing. One felt that behind the windows, with their white blinds, the long spring evening had not yet grown dark. One heard from the street the thudding of hooves. In the middle of the room, there was a monotonous splash-splash of the little fountain in an aquarium, round which goldfish, with their scales peeling off, lighted somehow from below, swam through the water. A waiter in white brought the dinner things, bread and a decanter of cold vodka. Kazimir Stanislavovich began drinking the vodka, held it in his mouth before swallowing it, and having swallowed it, smelt the black bread as though with loathing. With suddenness which gave even him a start, a gramophone began to roar out through the room a mixture of Russian songs, now exaggeratingly boisterous and turbulent, now too tender, drawling, and sentimental and Kazimir Stanislavovich's eyes grew red, and tears filmed them at that sweet, snuffling drone of the machine. Then a gray-haired, curly-black-eyed Georgian brought him on a large iron fork a half-cooked, smelly shatchlik, cut off the meat onto the plate with a kind of dissolute smartness, and with Asiatic simplicity, with his own hand sprinkled on it onions, salt, and rusty barbary powder, while the gramophone roared out in the empty hall a cakewalk, inciting one to jerks and spasms. Then Kazimir Stanislavovich was served cheese, fruit, red wine, coffee, mineral water, liquors. The gramophone had long ago grown silent. Instead of it there had been playing on the platform an orchestra of German women dressed in white. The lighted hall, continually filling up with people, grew hot, became dim with tobacco smoke, and heavily saturated with the smell of food. Waiters rushed about in a whirl. Drunken people ordered cigars which immediately made them sick. The head waiters showed excessive officiousness, combined with an intense realization of their own dignity. In the mirrors, in the watery gloom of their abysses, there was more and more chaotically reflected something huge, noisy, complicated. Several times Kazimir Stanislavovich went out of the hot hall into the cool corridors, into the cool laboratory where there was a strange smell of the sea. He walked as if on air, and on returning to his table again ordered wine. After midnight, closing his eyes and drawing the fresh night air through his nostrils into his intoxicated head, he raced in a handsome cab on rubber tires out of town to a brothel. He saw in the distance infinite chains of light, running away somewhere down a hill, and then uphill again, but he saw it just as if it were not he, but someone else seeing it. In the brothel he nearly had a fight with a stout gentleman who attacked him shouting that he was known to all thinking Russia. Then he lay dressed on a broad bed covered with a satin quilt, in a little room half lighted from the ceiling by a sky-blue lantern, with a sickly smell of scented soap, and with dresses hanging from a hook on the door. Near the bed stood a dish of fruit, and the girl who had been hired to entertain Kazimir Stanislavovich, silently, greedily with relish, ate a pear, cutting off slices with a knife, and her friend with fat bare arms, dressed only in a chemise which made her look like a little girl, was rapidly writing on the toilet table, taking no notice of them. She wrote and wept. Of what? There are lots of people in the world. One can't know everything. On the 10th of April, Kazimir Stanislavovich woke up early. Judging from the start with which he opened his eyes, one could see that he was overwhelmed by the idea that he was in Moscow. He had gotten back after four in the morning. He staggered down the staircase of the Versailles, but without a mistake he went straight to his room, down the long, stinking tunnel of a corridor which was lighted only at its entrance by a little lamp smoking sleepily. Outside every room stood boots and shoes, all of strangers, unknown to one another, hostile to one another. Suddenly a door opened, almost terrifying Kazimir Stanislavovich. On its three-hold appeared an old man, 
looking like a third-rate actor acting the memoirs of a lunatic, and Kazimir Stanislavovich saw a lamp under the green shade and the room crowded with things, the cave of a lonely old lodger, with icons in their corner and innumerable cigarette boxes piled one upon another almost to the ceiling near the icons. Was that the half-crazy writer of the lives of the saints who had lived in the Versailles twenty-three years ago? Kazimir Stanislavovich's dark room was terribly hot, with a malignant and smelly dryness. The light from the window over the door came faintly into the darkness. Kazimir Stanislavovich went behind the screen, took the top hat off his thin, greasy hair, threw his overcoat over the end of his bare bed. As soon as he lay down, everything began to turn round him, to rush into an abyss, and he fell asleep instantly. In his sleep, all the time he was conscious of the smell of the iron washstand which stood close to his face, and he dreamt of a spring day, trees in blossom, the hall of a manor house and a number of people waiting anxiously for the bishop to arrive at any moment, and all night long he was wearied and tormented with that waiting. Now in the corridors of the Versailles, people rang, ran, called to one another. Behind the screen, through the double dusty window panes, the sun shone. It was almost hot. Kazimir Stanislavovich took off his jacket, rang the bell, and began to wash. There came in a quick-eyed boy, the page boy, with fox-colored hair on his head, in a frock coat and pink shirt. A loaf, samovar, and lemon, Kazimir Stanislavovich said without looking at him. And tea and sugar? the boy asked with Moscow sharpness. A minute later he rushed in with a boiling samovar in his hand, held out level with his shoulders. On the round table in front of the sofa, he quickly put the tray with a glass and a battered brass slot basin, and thumped the samovar down on the tray. Kazimir Stanislavovich, while the tea was drawing, mechanically opened the Moscow daily, which the page boy had brought in with the samovar. His eye fell on a report that yesterday an unknown man had been picked up unconscious. The victim was taken to a hospital, he read, and threw the paper away. He felt very bad and unsteady. He got up and opened the window. It faced the yard, and a breath of freshness and of the city came to him. There came to him the melodious shouts of hawkers, the bells of horse trams humming behind the house opposite, the blended rap-tap of the cars, the musical drones of church bells. The city had long since started in its huge, noisy life in that bright, jolly, almost spring day. Kazimir Stanislavovich squeezed the lemon into the glass of tea and greedily drank the sour, muddy liquid. Then he again went behind the screen. The Versailles was quiet. It was pleasant and peaceful. His eye wandered leisurely over the hotel notice on the wall. A stay of three hours is reckoned as a full day. A mouse scuttled into the chest of drawers, rolled about a piece of sugar left there by some visitor. Thus half asleep, Kazimir Stanislavovich lay for a long time behind the screen until the sun had gone from the room and another freshness was wafted in from the window, the freshness of evening. Then he carefully got himself in order. He undid his bag, changed his underclothing, took out a cheap but clean handkerchief, brushed his shiny frock coat, top hat, and overcoat, took out of its torn pocket a crumpled Kiev newspaper of January 15th, and threw it away into the corner. Having dressed and combed his whiskers with a dying comb, he counted his money. There remained in his purse four rubles, seventy kopecks, and went out. Exactly at six o'clock he was outside a low, ancient little church in the Molchinovka. Behind the church fence, a spreading tree was just breaking into green. Children were playing there. The black stocking of one thin little girl jumping over a rope was continually coming down, and he sat there on a bench among perambulators with sleeping babies and nurses in Russian costumes. Sparrows pratted all over the tree. The air was soft, all but summer. Even the dust smelled of summer. The sky above the sunset behind the houses melted into a gentle gold, and one felt that once more there was somewhere in the world joy, youth, happiness. In the church the chandeliers were already burning, and there stood the pulpit, and in front of the pulpit was spread a little carpet. Kazimir Stanislavovich cautiously took off his top hat, trying not to untidy his hair, and entered the church nervously. He went into a corner, but a corner from which he could see the couple to be married. He looked at the painted vault, raised his eyes to the cupola, and his every movement and every gasp echoed loudly through the silence. The church shone with gold. The candles sputtered expectantly, and now the priests and choir began to enter, crossing themselves with the carelessness which comes of habit. Then old women, 
children, smart wedding guests, and worried stewards. A noise was heard in the porch, the crunching wheels of a carriage, and everyone turned their heads towards the entrance, and the hymn burst out, Come, my dove! Kazimir Stanislavovich became deadly pale, and his heart beat, and unconsciously he took a step forward, and close by him there passed her veil touching him, and a breath of lily of the valley, she who did not know even of his existence in the world, she passed, bending her charming head, all flowers and transparent gauze, all snow-white and innocent, happy and timid, like a princess going to her first communion. Kazimir Stanislavovich hardly heard the bridegroom who came to meet her, a rather small, broad-shouldered man with yellow, close-cropped hair. During the whole ceremony only one thing was before his eyes, the bent head and the flowers in the veil and the little hand trembling as it held a burning candle tied with a white ribbon and a bow. About ten o'clock he was back again in the hotel. All his overcoat smelt of the spring air. After coming out of the church, he had seen near the porch the car lined with white satin, and its window reflecting the sunset, and behind the window there flashed on him for the last time the face of her who was being carried away from him forever. After that he had wandered about in the little streets, and had come out on the Novensky Boulevard. Now slowly, and with trembling hands, he took off his overcoat, put on the table a paper bag containing two green cucumbers, which for some reason he had bought at a hawker's stall. They too smelt of spring even through the paper, and spring-like through the upper pane of the window, the April moon shone silvery high, up in the not-yet-darkened sky. Kazimir Stanislavovich lit a candle, sadly illuminating his empty, casual home, and sat down on the sofa feeling on his face the freshness of evening. Thus he sat for a long time. He did not ring the bell, gave no orders, locked himself in. All this seemed suspicious to the porter who had seen him enter the room with his shuffling feet and taking the key out of the door in order to lock himself in from the inside. Several times the porter stole up on tiptoe to the door and looked through the keyhole. Kazimir Stanislavovich was sitting on the sofa, trembling and wiping his face with a handkerchief, and weeping so bitterly, so copiously, that the brown dye came off and was smeared over his face. At night he tore the cord off the blind, and seeing nothing through his tears, began to fasten it to the hook of the clothes peg. But the guttering candle flickered, and the paper bag and terrible dark waves swam and flickered over the locked room. He was old, weak, and he himself was well aware of it. No, it was not in his power to die by his own hand. In the morning, he started for the railway station about three hours before the train left. At the station, he quietly walked about among the passengers, with his eyes on the ground and tears stained. And he would stop unexpectedly now before one, and now before another, and in a low voice, evenly but without expression, he would say rather quickly, For God's sake, I am in a desperate position. My fare to Bryansk, if only a few kopecks. And some passengers, trying not to look at his top hat, at the worn velvet collar of his overcoat, at the dreadful face with the faded violet whiskers, hurriedly and with confusion, gave him something. And then, rushing out of the station onto the platform, he got mixed in the crowd and disappeared into it, while in the Versailles, which for two days, as it were, belonged to him, they carried away the slop pail, opened the window to the April sun and to the fresh air, noisily moved the furniture, swept up, and threw out the dust and with the dust there fell out under the table, under the tablecloth which slid onto the floor, his torn note, which he had forgotten with the cucumbers. I beg that no one be accused of my death. I was at the wedding of my only daughter, who... End of Kazimir Stanislavovich